I wish to cite Art Azurdia as a major influence in the preparation of these messages on Revelation. There are numerous sections that are quotations or paraphrases of Azurdia. Let's pray, shall we? God in heaven, we ask as we, as we look at this next portion of the book of Revelation that you would give us revelation, give us understanding of, of your word, that we might give glory and honor to your son, Jesus Christ. And we ask it in his name, amen. What's the revelation of, by the way? It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. What's it not the revelation of? The Antichrist. If you, you know, if you, if you can remember that, you will do so much better with the book of Revelation, just, just like that. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not the revelation of end times and an evil man in Europe. Um, beware of those who tell you that that's what the book is about. Uh, we are currently considering uh, the second to the last kind of section. We've already spent one week. We'll spend this week and, and Lord willing, next week looking at this second to the last section of the book. And that second to the last section of the book has a lot to do with God's judgment. Uh, the, the, the emphasis on judgment is increasing as we get towards the end of the book. Uh, the, the, judgment on the, um, the judgment on Babylon is what we're looking at last night and, or last week and, and this week. Um, We've been introduced to, and I want to just remind you, we've been introduced to five enemies of Christ and of his church. The first one, these are introduced to them in chapter 12. The first one is the dragon. Who is he? That's Satan. The second is the beast of the sea and then the beast of the land. And I don't want to put you on the spot to remember, so I'll tell you one more time. And if you know, you can just mouth them quietly and God will know and you'll get brownie points somewhere someday but the beast of the sea tends to not not hard and fast but tends to represent anti-christian government throughout the great tribulation of the church age the beast of the land tends to represent anti-christian religion and worldviews and philosophies during the great tribulation of the church age uh babylon Babylon, which, and you'll notice I'm saying tends because I'm going to, now I'm going to tweak it a little bit, tends to represent anti-Christian banking and business and monetary systems, all of the anti-Christian systems. And as it unfolds, they start to blur and Babylon starts to take on, when Babylon falls, we see the governments and the philosophies mourning for that too. You say, well, wait a minute, I thought that was the banking systems. Hey, anti-Christian government and anti-Christian religion, it's all about the money. So when the money fails, the government scream and the religion scream and everything else. And then lastly, we were introduced to another enemy of God, of Christ and of his people. And that's the people who have the mark of the beast. And as we've tried to graciously say, uh, we don't believe that this is referring to uh, some special time at the end of time when uh, people are given a tattoo or a microchip in the back of their hand or in their forehead. But rather, the mark of the beast is the antitype, is Satan's antitype of what? Come on now. The seal of the Holy Spirit. They're, God's people are sealed with the Holy Spirit. The people who are following the world system, the anti-Christian world system, they have the mark of the beast. The good news is, is that the seal is permanent and can't be moved. Once you're sealed by the Holy Spirit, you're sealed. Amen? Amen. And the further good news is that the mark of the beast is not irreversible. I remember being a new Christian and thinking, oh no, if our license plate came in the mail and it had a 666 on it, we were doomed and there was no way of repentance. These, this kind of thinking is, is silly and it's because we were immature in the Lord and because we were reading too many silly books and what have you. But, but the fact of the matter is the, the seal can't be erased, but the mark can be changed because God accepts people who repent from following the anti-Christian systems of the world to, to follow Christ. And so we, we praise God to that. So how do these different... Uh, individuals or systems oppose christ not only by attacking his gospel remember in chapter 12 they tried to attack the, the, the dragon tried to attack who the child couldn't destroy the who's the child christ couldn't destroy the child so who does 
Who does the dragon turn on? The woman who is representative of God's people. And so what we see here is that the, the, these, the dragon and then his various henchmen, the beast of the sea, the beast of the land, Babylon, these anti-Christian world systems, and then people who have the mark of the beast, uh, they, they, attack, they attack the people of God. And that's why it's the great tribulation. It's the great tribulation of the church age because the church is constantly under attack from a Christ-hating world. Chapters 15 and 16 showed the demise of those with the mark of the beast, so they're kind of out of the picture now. The vision revealed in chapters 17 and 18 reveal uh, what happens to Babylon and the two beasts, and we're in the middle of that. And then um, chapter 19 will show really the great news. The, we'll, we'll focus on the victory party of Christ. And uh, then chapter 20, we'll, we'll get to the demise of the dragon himself. What happened in chapter 17, just to remind you, verses 1 through 6, if you're looking at it, we were given information about Babylon, the world system that opposes Christ, Christ's gospel and Christ's people. In verses 7 through 18, we were given the, the backstory, if you will, the backstory of Babylon from uh, history to see that the great world empires that have opposed God have all been in the past, what? Destroyed by God. Even in John's day, he talks about five that came. You remember who they are? Okay. Ancient Babylonia, the Assyrians, Neo-Babylonia, the Medes and the Persians, the Greeks. There's the five. They've come and gone. One is, in John's day, who's that? Rome. And one will be. And we would say that... Uh, for sure, that represents all Christian, anti-Christian world governments since. But in particular, I believe, and I'm not saying thus saith the Lord, but I believe that there will be one great anti-Christian government in the, at the very end. At the very end, which is what we will see Christ defeat in, in the very end. Um, so now we get to chapter 18. And we're going to hear the, about the fall of Babylon. Babylon, again, is the embodiment of all Christian, anti-Christian empires that oppose the Lord. And in this chapter, we read more about the ultimate fall of Babylon. We've seen the falls in history. Now we're, going to, we're, we're projecting forward from John's day to see what will happen when Christ comes again. This chapter 18 that we'll look at this evening can be divided into four sections. If you're looking at your Bible and you'd like to put pencil marks where the breaks are, uh, the first lament over the destruction of Babylon is verses 1 through 3. The command to flee, the command to God's people to flee from Babylon, verses 4 through 8. The second lament, verses 9 through 20, it's a little longer. And then, uh, what did I title it? I had a working title and I changed it because it seemed better. Uh, the, the utter destruction. The complete destruction of Babylon in uh, verses 21 through 24. So the first lament, 18, chapter, one, eight, chapter 18, verse 1. After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a habitation of demons for a prison and for every foul spirit and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. It's kind of interesting. If you look back in chapter 17, uh, in verse 5, we see you know, this great proclamation from the world's standpoint Babylon, the mystery Babylon, but it's all, it's, what is it? It's called there the mother of harlots. Well, now we get to the place where the angels are, are crying out that it is, uh, is, is going to fall. So this first lament, Babylon's fall is announced, and interestingly, it is announced as though it has already happened. Why is that? Well, there's more than one explanation for why it's announced as though it has already happened. First of all, it has already happened numerous times. If we believe, which I do, that Babylon is representative of all anti-Christian governments throughout and empires throughout history. And as we read in the last chapter, five of those that have opposed God have already fallen in, in, uh, 
John's day. Um, it, so it's happened numerous times, but we would also say, but wait a minute, Pastor, didn't you tell us that there is a likely, I'm not going to say thus said the Lord, but I believe it, that there is a, a one last gasp, a great, and I believe it'll be the greatest, and I, I mean great not in the sense of with God's endorsement, but great in the sense of its power and might. There will be one last great anti-Christian world empire that will seek to dominate the world and destroy the church, but that Christ will show up and, and defeat that. But if that hasn't happened, why is it stated in the past tense? Well, we see that in the Scriptures elsewhere, too. Something that hasn't happened is stated in the past tense to emphasize what? What do you think? The, the, assurance, the assurance that it's going to happen. How many of you are familiar with a little chapter? It's a little obscure chapter in Isaiah called Isaiah 53 about the suffering servant, about Christ, and about the cross. And it's all written in past tense. Isaiah was hundreds of years before Christ went to the cross, but it's written in past tense, as prophecy frequently is, in order to emphasize that it is as good as done. And notice there at the end of this section, I just read Babylon's utter destruction is pictured as, quote, a habitation of demons and a prison of for every foul spirit. Those words are kind of telling you that this isn't a Christ-honoring group. <laughs> this isn't a God, God-glorifying group. Verse 3, for all the nations. Now notice he says, cry with a mighty voice because it's fallen. Why? Before or what? For or because. This is why to cry. All the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. So in verse three, the reason for Babylon's demise is placed on three groups of people. The first, if you notice there in verse three, the nations and the nations. See, the reason he's saying mourn you people in the world who were counting on the world Mourn you people in the world who are counting on this anti-Christian world system to be your savior. Uh, mourn because it didn't work. Instead of instead of this this spiritual lover, and again we talk about uh, this thing. This, this the nations have drunk the wine of the wrath of her fornication. That is, there's a lot of really. Uh, descriptive words in there the world has been the nations the the nations the godless in the world it's as though they've been inebriated intoxicated with the world system and the promises of the world systems Um, and what does it bring about wrath and then the, the term fornication, they're, again, always speaking, not in, in Revelation, not so much speaking of, of uh, physical sexual sin, but of spiritual adultery, spiritual uh, unfaithfulness to God. It goes, mourn because the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The second group of people mentioned, who is it there in, in verse 3? The kings of the earth. First, the nations of the earth, but then the kings of the earth who have fornicated, who have been spiritually uh, unfaithful and committed spiritual adultery with the world systems rather than following God. And then interestingly enough, and this is where we get, as I've told you before, Babylon is first and foremost a picture of the world systems of money, of banking, of commerce, etc. What does it say in verse 3? It says... And the merchants of the earth, the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. So mourn because the merchants of the earth who have enriched themselves through the abundance of her luxury. Hey, when Babylon goes down, that that pulls the plug on your whole plan, pulls the plug on the whole plan. All three categories include those who have wallowed in and profited from the world systems and again note the terms drunk with wine speaking of being intoxicated with worldliness you know it's it's like yes master it's this kind of people forget how to think and and you know if i dare say i I, I apologize i'm going to tell you there are so many christians today who are marching to the tune of antichrists 
who are talking about money and government. Wake up, people. Wake up. You know? So many Christians just think, well, conservative politics, that's the same as Christianity. No, it's not. Glenn Beck is not a Christian. And so many Christians can quote him more than they can the Gospels. There's something wrong with that. You know what? It's because it's, yes, Master, I believe in my government. I believe in the banking system. I believe in the Dow Jones. I believe it. Listen, trust in Christ. Because all those other things will fail. It may be the ultimate failure will be long after we're gone. I can't say. I don't know. But if your trust is in the, you know what? If your trust is in, if it, your trust is in those things, if your trust is in the world systems, especially as they're being led by people who don't love Christ, people who give lip service to Christianity or who claim to be Christian when they're members of a major cult, you're coming real close to slapping that mark on yourself. Now, again, it's not a tattoo and a chip, but what it is is it's saying, I'm associated with, I belong to the world system. You don't want to be a part of that. You don't want to be a part of it. Also, the uh, you know, dr- drunk with wine, the fornication, again, speaking of spiritual adultery, rich through the abundance of luxury, speaks of materialism. We have to be careful with these things. You know, Jesus said the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, right? Son of man has no place to lay his head. Well, good thing I'm not the son of man. Hey, you're supposed to be one of his followers. Does that mean you can't own anything? No, but if you're trusting in owning things, if that's what gives you your, your fulfillment and your delight, be very careful. Because i tell you why. Because these things bring the judgment of God. They bring the judgment of God. Folks, these things the godless Christ haters of the world seek after. Don't join them. Don't join them. The second section of this chapter 18 is verse 4 through 8. And it's this command to flee. He goes, then I heard another voice from heaven. This is the first one is saying, hey, this is going to be huge. And it's, it's a lamentation of the world saying, oh, no, the things we trusted in aren't working. Yeah, no kidding. Well, now there's another voice heard from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. Now, this is a voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. So this isn't about the godless. This is about God, uh, either either his voice or the voice of an angel doesn't matter. But it's a voice from heaven to God's people saying, come out from Babylon. Don't be a part of that. I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins unless you receive of her plagues. So in this verse, in the verses that follow, a voice from heaven calls God's people to flee from the wrath to come that is associated with following the world's systems, following the world's governments and uh, worldviews, uh, philosophies, religions, and banking system. Now, this is anything but unique. God's people are always called to separate from the world now when we're called to separate from the world just a little 101a on christian living here you should know this but let me just say it again because we need to hear it over and over again the call to flee is not a call to physically get out of the world where are you going to go uh it's virtually impossible to to get out of the world and out of uh having any um having any experience with God's judgment if you happen to be uh, there when God's pouring out His wrath. Uh, because, folks, again, another myth that some Christians believe that you know God will... The righteous don't suffer. And that's why this whole idea... And please forgive me, I don't mean to put anybody down, but this whole idea that, that the church is going to be somehow taken out of the world, it's not true. It's just not true. There's no promise in Scripture that says God's people on this planet are are, uh, exempted from suffering. When the world is being judged, if there's Christians in the world, Christians will... Is anybody here reading the book of Daniel? You notice how God just, you know, the people and the the righteous people in uh, Jerusalem were just spared, right? No. You know, I don't get too graphic here, but do, do you remember... You know, Daniel was one of the cream of the crop of the of the Jewish nation. He was taken to Babylon when, by God's hand, Babylon was used as the rod of discipline on unfaithful Judah, the nation of Judah. You remember what his job was and who his boss was? What was that guy? 
He was the prince of the eunuchs. Don't tell me the righteous don't suffer with the ungodly. You know, God used him there, but that just it's just it's just not true. Um, what it is a call is to be clear of the influence of the world so as not to be a recipient of the judgment. Jesus in John 17, verse 14 through 18, tells us to be in the world, but not of the world. He specifically prays to the Father, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world. I don't know where you're going to do with that. Uh, We cannot be out of the world or else how are we going to evangelize and be preservatives in the world? But, 1 John 2 says, do not what? Love the world. You know, that's so, that's so slippery. That's so elusive because we could say, well, I don't love the world. Say, you know, you don't love the world because you don't jump up and down and say, I love the world. But, you know, you and, and I as believers, we need to check ourselves. You know, the way to find out what you love is to find out what you invest yourself in, what you give yourself to. You know, are, are you as excited about the things of the Lord as you get about what's going on in the world? Um, you know, again, forgive me, but it, it just seems like it's sad to me that more Christians are, are, are more, more moved and excited and, and agitated and, and elated over the results of elections than they are that King Jesus reigns. You know, think about it. Not to say these things don't matter, but the thing is, is what is it that really gets you going? What is it that really gets you going? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian. But you know, did you hear about what's going on? And uh, Okay, whatever. Verse 5. For her sins have reached heaven, and God has remembered her inequities. Again, for, because. Come out of her, my people, verse 4, lest you share in her sins, unless you receive her plagues. Because her sins, whose sins? The world, Babylon, because her sins have reached to heaven. It's, it's a figure of speech. It's just like, you know, when we say something stinks to high heaven. Well, their sins have mounted up to heaven uh, in, a, in a figurative language. And God has remembered her iniquities. Yeah, he sure does. He, he's going to hold her responsible for it. So the godly must be unspotted uh, by Babylon's sins because Babylon's sins have piled up to heaven and therefore call for a most dramatic judgment on the world system. Uh, Psalm 103 says, uh, If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? Well, here's the thing. God has remembered her iniquities. Who, whose iniquities? The iniquities of the world. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities or keep tally of iniquities, who could stand? Answer? No one. But there is forgiveness with you, the psalmist says, that you may be, does anybody remember? Feared. That you may be feared. It's talking about, it's talking about two different groups of people, especially in light of this. God does mark iniquities of the world. The world is going to be held accountable for its sins. And he tells us, you know, come out from that. Do not be a part of that. God does not mark our sins and hold them against us, but he does keep count of the world's sins and Trust the word of God. Not a one of the world's sins will escape God's justice. Now, just as a little aside, not one of mine will escape God's justice either. The good news is the justice recompensed for my sin was poured out on Christ on the cross. That's the only difference. Justice is served either way. Because God is just. Verse 6. Render to her just as she rendered to you and repay her double according to her works in the cup which she has mixed. Mix for her double. So there's a couple of things to consider in this passage. The first is who is rendering what to whom? Don't you like questions like that? You don't even know what I'm talking about, probably. Uh, what does he say here? Render to he's, he's saying render to her this and that. Well, who is he speaking to in verse four? I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. He's addressing uh, God's addressing his people. So it appears that God is speaking to his people. But see, here's the question. Is he addressing us that God's people are somehow going to have a hand 
in the vengeance and justice of God on the world. Now, we don't we don't like to think about that. That doesn't sound like that. That's us. But. um, It's absolutely biblical. Has anybody read a book called Joshua? So in the the Old Testament, in Joshua, what were God's people? See, we make a huge mistake if we think that God told the Israelites to go in and just arbitrarily, you know, I'm going to give you a piece of property and it's a nice piece of property, but there's some people there, so I want you to go kill them. That is not why they were told to destroy the Canaanites. They were not told to destroy the Canaanites so that God could give his people some real estate. That was a part of it. But what did God tell Abraham Several hundreds of years before that, your people will go. He says, your ancestors will go to Egypt. They'll be there for 400 years. They'll come out when the iniquity of the Amorites is full. You see, God was God was doing double duty on that. He was providing the land for his people that he would promised to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. But he was also using Israel as a rod of, of judgment on people groups that were so wicked, who had been given 400 plus years to repent and who had not, and were, were, were wicked to the point where they were burning their children alive as sacrifices to false gods. How could God allow... So listen, God's always on the hook with people that don't like Him. People love to say, how could God of love allow evil in the world? You know, when God does say, uh, he's very patient, he allows us to run our course and do a lot of bad things. But then when he says, okay, that's enough, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to judge these people, we say, that's terrible, how could he have judged all these people? You know, you can't have it both ways. You can't have it both ways. God was using the righteous, his nation Israel, to judge the unrighteous. And we see this, uh, throughout the the Old Testament, our New Testament sensitivities kind of say that this doesn't seem uh, like we would want that or it doesn't seem right to us. But God not only uses the godly to judge the wicked, he 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 uses the godless to judge the wicked. Who's who's read a book called Habakkuk? God, Habakkuk is crying out to God saying, oh, your people are so evil. How, you know, how long are you going to let this go? God says, you know, I, I have a plan here. Habakkuk, uh, but if I told you, you wouldn't like it. You wouldn't, you wouldn't believe it. He goes, try me. So he goes, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send the Babylonians over and they're going to pretty much destroy this place. What? How can you use them? They're more wicked than we are. God says, hey, I'll use whatever, what? I want. And so he uses people. Listen, if you read the Bible, you'll see one of the more common ways that God judges nations is by turning nations over to their enemies. Not just good, not just bad. Uh, enemies sometimes well in this particular case the the rod of god's judgment um will in some way uh god's people now again this doesn't seem right to us but think about it god's people will share in his vengeance doesn't that bug you as a christian to hear me say that oh uh, judge vengeance is the lord yeah that's what i just said it's his vengeance But on this planet, he doesn't just throw lightning bolts from heaven to execute judgment. What does he do on this planet to execute judgment? He uses people and the the uh, people of God will share in his vengeance. The one thing to remember is that it is his vengeance. It is not ours. Even if God is pleased to be uh, if God is pleased to use us as the instruments of judgment in his hand. So it's not completely foreign to the scriptures. The second thing to consider in this passage is the idea behind the the, uh, the uh, phrase, repay the guilty double. Well, wait a minute, that doesn't sound just. God is, is just. Well, it's not the best rendering of it. Um, Kistemaker writes, quote, the words give her back double go back to a Hebrew idiom that signifies, quote, to produce a duplicate. It doesn't mean if you've done four, we're going to pay you back with eight. The, the double means what you've done, we're going to do the same. So it is, it is justice that God is after. Uh, he goes on to say the idiom ought not to be translated literally. Therefore, the translation in English to give the full sense would be better to say, quote, give her the very equivalent according to her works, that is, pay her back in kind. 
And of course, that is that is justice. And that's what God does. Um, Verse seven. In the measure that she glorified herself and lived luxury. Who are we talking about? The world, Babylon. In the measure that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously, in the same measure, give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen, and I am no widow, and I will not see sorrow. You know, we live in a day and age where we are so, in our society particularly, we are so, for the most part, so insulated from suffering and pain. We don't, you know, we, we just assume that everything that's, that's painful has got to be bad. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. I mean, besides the obvious, if you have no pain in your body, so, oh, I should never feel pain. Yeah, well, you'll be a mess if you don't feel pain because you'll bump your head and not know it and bleed to death before you realize. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but you see what I'm saying? Pain is a good thing. Pain tells us something's wrong. Um, This verse 7 is just talking about the severity of God's wrath. In the same way that the world sought luxury, God is going to give her the opposite. To the same measure that she sought luxury, God will give her the same measure of judgment. It reminds me a little bit of the story of Lazarus and the rich man. Remember when God said to Lazarus, he goes, oh, you know, or the rich man, he says, you know, you, you lived in luxury and you had everything. Meanwhile, this poor guy over here was suffering, you know. Now you are having, you are having um, torment in an equal opposite measure to uh, his delight now. Equal to his torment then e- and equal opposite to his delight now and back and forth. So God says, yeah, you want to know what... Um, by the way, this is another reason. And again, with all due respect to those who say, well, I don't believe that hell is an eternal place. Well, OK, well, you don't you disagree with God. So good luck. But. If if heaven is complete bliss for eternity with God, hell is complete torment. At God's hand, it's just they're the opposites. They're not you can't have it both ways. In verse eight, it says, therefore, her plagues will come. In one day death and mourning and famine and she will be utterly burned with fire for strong is the lord god who judges her so in verse eight three things i want you to notice number one judgment will come in one hour a it's it doesn't mean it's going to happen in 60 minutes it means it's going to happen swiftly it means babylon's going along thinking everything's fine and all of a sudden boom somebody pulls the rug out it's going to it, when it comes, it's going to come swiftly. It doesn't come right away because God is so patient. God is so kind. Um, he's patient and kind. But when it's time, it's time. The second thing to notice from verse eight is that judgment will be severe. They'll come in in one day, one hour uh, quickly, uh, death, morning, and, and she will be utterly burned with fire. So it's going to be very, very severe. The reason and this is the third thing to notice from verse eight. Who's the judge? God. God doesn't do anything halfway. <laughs> God doesn't do anything halfway. He does it all out because he's God. And God is, is the judge and God is, is strong. Now, the third section of this chapter, the longest section, verse 9 through verse 20, begins the second lament. So we had the first lament saying, oh, you know, this is all coming and it's going to be terrible. Then we hear this call, come out from her, my people. You come out from her and you will be a part of my my hand of vengeance on her. You'll be an instrument of my judgment. Exactly how that works out, I don't know, but that's what he says. But now we have a second lament. And this second lament reveals two groups of people who mourn and who lament the destruction of Babylon. Now, again, remember, Babylon is a system that transcends any particular spot on the timeline. We know that because it's been happening uh, in the Old Testament times and on up through New Testament times. It's not, a, it's in, not a, any particular time or any particular nation, although I, it manifests, Babylon is manifested at certain points. It's punctuated with, with really over-the-top uh, anti-Christian world empires, as we've seen from history, and, and as I said, one which I believe will be coming. Who are the two groups that mourn the destruction of Babylon? Well, the first group, verse 9 and 10, and the kings of the earth 
who committed fornication and lived luxuriously with her, with Babylon, will weep and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, the great city Babylon. Remember, the one that we loved, that mighty city. For in one hour your judgment has come. It's the same concept of the one day and the one hour. So, the first group that laments the destruction of Babylon will be the kings of the earth who committed spiritual fornication and who lived in luxury with the Babylonian anti-Christian system. The powerful who committed spiritual fornication by doing what? By worshiping at the altar of power and of luxury. Now, you, may, you and I may not feel very much like we live in luxury, or excuse me, in, in a lot of power. But you know, for the most part, again, we, we are so unaware. It's the water we swim in so we don't realize it. We live in luxury. Even the, those in lower middle class live in luxury that, that people throughout history never dreamed of. With the possible exception of a few punctuated people like the Caesars and like like uh, you know Nebuchadnezzar and other you know, but the, it, it's common now. I mean, we're just now. I'm not saying that having nice things is wrong. Don't read into what I'm saying. But the difference is, is what what is our heart attachment to these things? Spiritual fornication by worshiping at the altar of luxury. And I was really bummed, really bummed when we bought our our last new car. My last new car is the car my wife drives right now. It's It's a 2000. We bought it a year and a half ago or two. That to us is a new car. <laughs> it's like eight years old. You know, we have a system. I won't go into it, but I tell you, if you buy cars that old people like, you can use cars that old people like. You can get cars that are old that hardly have any miles on them. And that's what we do. And cars that old people like are Buicks. <laughs> I was so bummed when I got at home and realized that that the little things that open the door, even though I thought they did, they don't automatically adjust the seats. <laughs> Every time I get in the car, I've got, I've got to like contort myself to get in there because the little thing in my hand will not automatically adjust the seat. What a baby. <laughs> you know? Now, I'm telling that on myself. As a silly example, but the thing is, is, you know, how many things we just can't live without. Are we are we committing spiritual adultery at the altar of luxury? We've got to be careful with these things. Um, when it's over. The people who worship luxury, when it's all gone, they're going to be devastated. You know. Uh, high expectations, high demands, when they're not met, bring about great lows. And that's why it says that they're going to be weeping and mourning. Big surprise, you know, when your God fails, you weep and lament, not so much for her as for your loss. And that's what's happening when the kings of the earth or those who insist on, in our day, living like kings, when the system doesn't come through. You know what? Your gold isn't going to help you. It's not going to help you. God paves the streets of heaven with that. It's just like it's asphalt. You know, am I saying don't don't try to be wise with you? I'm not saying that. It's where your heart is with this stuff. Am I so concerned? I mean, I can't even listen to most, I mean, I can't. I, I listen to certain Christian radio programs, but I have to turn off the ads on Christian radio because they are Babylonian worship. It's terrible, and the, and it's in the church. Well, 
And again, the swiftness of the judgment. Once it's time, God is patient, but he's not forever. And then the second group, the first are the kings of the earth. And I would even say those who insist on living like kings. The second group, verse 11 through 19, who is that? He says, and the merchants of the earth. So here we are again. This is why we say Babylon is so closely associated with the monetary and banking and, and, and commerce systems of the earth. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn when Babylon falls. Why? Because no one's buying my stuff anymore. The economy's bad. I better jump off a building. What does that tell you? And then in verse 12, it's interesting. Merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls, fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet, every kind of citron wood, every kind of object of ivory, every kind of, uh, every kind of object of most precious wood, and, and the way that the, the grammar here, it's not most precious wood, oh yeah, and things that are bronze and iron and marble, but it's most precious wood, most precious bronze, most precious iron, most precious marble, and cinnamon, and incense, fragrant oil, and frankincense, wine and oil, fine flour and wheat, and cattle and sheep, and horses and chariots, and bodies and souls of men. This is the, uh, this is the uh, portfolio that's going to fall apart. Why do the merchants mourn? Because as we have said, Babylon has a great deal to do with money. The merchants are not limited to mom and pop businesses. And they're not limited to multinational corporations. The merchants are all those whose lives revolve around money systems. Because when those money systems fail, those who worship at the altar of commerce, regardless of whether it's mom and pop uh, diner or whether it's a multinational corporation like PepsiCo or something like that, they're going to weep and mourn because it's like, wait a minute, it's not working anymore. What are you trusting in that for? God could have told you that's not going to work. He, in fact, he did tell you it's not going to work. Now, like I say, verse 12 and 13, the list of the merchants uh, is illustrative. It's not exhaustive. I uh, say, oh, good, I don't, I, none of those are in my portfolio. They said, no, no, look at let me, it's illustrative. Uh, let me just point out a couple of things about this list. Some commentators suggest that they are primarily luxury items, pointing out man's addiction to luxury, and that's true. Uh, some commentators point out that humans are listed last, which is interesting, suggesting that, that in the end, people who are living for, the, for the, the Babylonian system, what's the cheapest thing? People. The most expendable thing on the list are the souls and, and bodies of people. People have, the, have less value. Gosh, in our, in our day and age, obviously it's, it's the lunatic fringe, but I mean some people think that pets are more valuable than human beings. That's, 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 that's blasphemy against God because human beings are created in the image of God and animals aren't. Don't tell me I don't like animals. I do like animals. I think barbecue is one of the best things possible. <laughs> Uh, you know, but when people go want to get a degree in like plant psychology and stuff, it's like, oh, brother. Um, and then another interesting thing about this list is that are the bodies and the souls of men a reference to human slavery? You know, I mean, I'm sure some of you are very much aware that that, is, that isn't just slavery isn't just something in the history that we want to beat up America for, for our, our great national sin of uh of enslaving people yeah that was the great national sin if it's being if it's been eclipsed it's been eclipsed by abortion that's a bigger national sin because those are just people just slaughtered there's far more people far more human beings have been aborted than were ever enslaved in this nation but you know don't think that slavery is just something out of out of history there's slaves all over the world today and in some of the worst possible ways the 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 human trafficking uh, of, of human beings for, for sex and for things like that. It's terrible. And, and the thing that my thought was, is the bodies and souls of men a reference to the cheapness of life and human slavery? No doubt, but it doesn't stop there because whether slaves or free men, those who treat people like beasts of burden, like a commodity or like a machine, instead of human beings created in the image of God, trust me, judgment is coming for those people. We live in a place in our economy, and I know some of you are the unfortunate recipients of this. We live in a place in our economy where business is perfectly, perfectly happy in order to save money, to put you on salary, and to squeeze your life out of you. 
Now, I'm not saying this, you know, what are you going to do about it? I'm not even going to offer it because I don't know what you're going to do about that. You're going to have to work that out. But we see companies, it used to be that companies cared about their employees. Not anymore, because employees are the cheapest thing. They're, they're expensive to maintain, but, but that's why we don't care about the people, because we care more about the money, because we can get more out of them. This is the Babylonian system, and we're living in it. And, it's, and I'm not saying we're in the, the last hurrah. I don't know, but we are in a place where it's, it's, it's coming and, and, and reaching a crescendo. Whether it's the final crescendo, I don't know. Verse 14, And the fruit that your soul longed for has gone from you. Again, speaking of the people who loved Babylon, uh, the kings of the earth and the merchants particularly, he says, The fruit that your soul longed for has gone from you. It didn't work out, did it? Wow. And all the things which are rich and splendid have gone from you and you shall find them no more at all. Wow. People's love for and dependence upon profit reveals their hearts. This is why one of the worst, most damnable heresies that parades itself as Christianity is the health and wealth gospel. It's an absolute perversion of Christianity to say Jesus Christ died on the cross so you can be rich. That is one of the most horrible perversions of Christianity you're ever going to find. The things that you want, it, 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 you're not going to find them. That's not what it's all about. Verse 15, the merchants of these things who became rich by her will stand at a distance for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing. It's like, oh, what's happening? What's happening? saying, Alas, alas, the great city that was clothed with fine linen, purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. Alas, alas, yeah, it's for sure, it's gone. It didn't work out, did it? And who is it that's lamenting? The merchants. And their lamentation is mixed with awe because they never believed the money system could fail. You know, I'm, a, I'm optimistic about, you know, I don't know, about like three different things. I don't remember what they are, but I, I can be optimistic. But you know what? When people just keep saying, don't worry, America's going to work. Who said? Now, I am not anti-America and I want America to pull out of this thing and I want us to be strong, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Do not read into what I'm saying. But if your trust is that America can't fall, you're deluded. What makes this nation... God doesn't owe this nation anything. He doesn't owe any nation anything. He doesn't owe anybody anything. All things that exist owe everything to Him. And so we have a nation that's just pushing Him further away and pushing Him further away and pushing Him further away. We don't believe in a God who has anything to do except for He's got a big wallet and He's going to give us stuff. It's wrong. That's Babylon. That's, that's falling the, the Babylon. He said, and then what's going to happen? What happened? What happened? That's what they're saying in verse 15 and 16. What happened? What did the system's wealth do to pro, uh, protect and preserve itself? Nothing. Solomon in the Old Testament says, whoever trusts in silver, whoever loves silver will not be satisfied with silver. Whoever loves ab- abundance will not be satisfied with increase. It's not going to happen. But worse than finding that wealth and material possessions do not satisfy, those who live for these things will be condemned for their misplaced allegiance. It's bad enough to find, oh, it didn't work. Yeah, well, it didn't work, and you're going down with it if, that's, if you're one who is trusting in, in the world system. The first part of verse 17, for in one hour such great riches came to nothing. How quickly what took a lifetime to gather is destroyed. Think about it. It doesn't mean it happens 60 minutes. It just means that when God says it's done, it's done. Wait a minute. It was, was, FD, F, was it FDIC insured. <laughs> and, you know, can I tell you something about warranties? They're as good as the company who's backing them. Are you and am I? And are people today, Christians today, so deceived as to think that the government can guarantee anything but waste and sin and antichrist? What is the government, what is the government doing? I'm not talking about this administration. I'm talking about the government. I don't want them guaranteeing anything because they, they don't. They, they can't. 
You can't pay on a warranty if you're out of business. But then as you continue in verse 17, and every shipmaster, now it's interesting, we go from merchants to shipmasters, and every shipmaster, all who travel by ships, sailors, and as many as trade on the sea stood at a distance and cried out when they saw the smoke of her burning, Babylon's burning, saying, what is like this great city? And they threw dust on their heads and cried out, weeping and wailing and saying, alas, alas, that great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth, for in one hour she's made desolate. So it's, it's kind of interesting here. I think mentioning the sea merchants only serves to widen the focus to show that everyone involved in the enterprise of the world's systems of money, banking, and commerce who loves and lives for it is going to suffer judgment with it. And again, the house of cards collapses very swiftly and very completely. You have to understand that in in the day and age in which this was written, I mean, international commerce, ships, I mean, that was it. You know, that, that's what it was a picture of. And so we need to be aware of that. Now, verse 20, again, may seem very out of place. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. Wait a minute. The world is weeping and wailing and mourning because they've, they've followed this Babylonian system. It's fallen and the whole thing is, is unraveling. And then we hear God saying, hey, God said to his people, rejoice. Does that seem weird? It should, it should seem kind of weird, especially if you're, if you're you know, just a good, just real, a real sensitive Christian. You know, real sensitive. Rejoicing at the fall of the world's monetary systems is reason for rejoicing when it comes to this ultimate fall. Because this is a point at which God says, that's it. You're done. He does it every now and then when greed escalates to the point where he has to. I mean, you know, again, we, we talk about, well, the reason for the slowdown in the economy is this. The reason for the economy, look, the reason for everything is God. He orchestrates everything. You know, we say, oh, yeah, we believe God is sovereign, but he's not in control of the banking system. Oh, is that right? You know, it's amazing. I was listening to R.C. Sproul the other day, and he said, if you believe that God created everything, and you do not believe he is sovereign over everything, you are living a contradiction in your thinking. If he created everything, then everything is his. He, everything is subject to him. And so, so there's cycles where God orchestrates and uses secondary causes, etc., to bring about uh, slowdowns in economy to try to throttle back the greed and debauchery of human beings and uh, uh it's, it's called the like the dot-com bursting and that kind of stuff and and it's happening now but someday it's going to happen to the place where god's going to pull the plug and he's never going to let it be plugged back in again he says I'm, I'm babylon's done the world system is done you've played with it too long and it's completely done So those who knew better and were not a part of the system, those who did not have the mark of the beast by loving and living in the world's wealth will rejoice when the system falls. Why? Again, doesn't it sound weird that we should rejoice? We rejoice because God's word that warned against loving and living for the world's money will see that their faith in God was not misplaced. We will rejoice because our faith in God and our willingness to follow Him, even though it was like totally not in step with the world system, we will find that God was right, that we, that we were right for following Him, and that at just the right time, He's going to destroy the system that drew so many away from Him. It's His mercy to destroy everybody because they're just propagating themselves into oblivion. The rejoicing of heaven is not malicious vindictiveness. It's not, let's see, by the way, this is not what it is. Oh, when those people burn, I want to watch. No, 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 no. That's a hard problem that some people have. I'm not mentioning names, but um, could be, ooh, I don't know. Um, but it's, it's not malicious vindictiveness. It's for the glory and honor of God who opposed the world systems all along and who warned us about the world systems for so long God appeared to be wrong in the eyes of the world. And we will rejoice when it's like, hey, you know what? He was right. And he does everything right. And those who opposed him are now finding out in a big way 
It'll be cause for rejoicing. Judgment will be cause for rejoicing. Well, the last section, we've got to rush with this, the last section, verses 21 through 24, the utter and complete and total destruction and devastation of Babylon. Uh, then, verse 21, a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence the great city of Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found any more. Now, in fact, let me finish reading this. The sound of harpists, musicians, flautists, the trumpeters shall not be heard in you anymore. And no craftsman of any craft shall be found in you anymore. And the sound of a millstone shall not be heard in you anymore. And the light of a lamp shall not shine in you anymore. And the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall not be heard in you anymore. For your merchants were great men of the earth, for by your sorcery, trickery, etc., all the nations were deceived, speaking of Babylon. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and saints and of all who were slain on the earth. Now, did you notice, because I tried to emphasize this as I read it, did you notice a recurring phrase in this section? What does that recurring phrase tell us? This is absolute, eternal, final judgment. Will not be heard in you any more. It's not, you're going to go, we're going to put you down for a little while, but then we're going to bring you, no, you're done. It's, the Babylonian system will be done. So the key phrase is, shall not be found in you anymore. It occurs seven times, by the way, seven, book of Revelation, number for completeness. completeness. Not only is the phrase speaking of completeness, but it is said seven times, which talks about completeness. This phrase speaks of the finality, the, etern- uh, the eternality, and the irreversibility of God's judgment on Babylon. What is Babylon? Let me remind you again, the anti-Christian world systems of government, religion, and ultimately monetary and power systems. So in verse 21, the picture, and that's what it is, it's a symbolic picture, is of the world's systems being cast into the sea. You know, what a picture especially in John's day, of the end of a thing. You know, we might say today, because we have, you know, we're, we have space travel, you know. If we really want to get rid of something, we put it in a rocket and just send it off and just send it and just let it keep going. And Once it's out, it'll just keep going and, you know, all that's great. But, you know, in, in their day, if you, if you wanted to see a picture of something that was going to be gone and never seen it again, throw it in the ocean. It's gone. They didn't have, you know, Captain Nemo. You know, they didn't have submarines. They, they didn't have, you know, we're still digging up Titanic. When are we going to be done with that thing? Anyway, uh, <laughs> we're doing, listen, in his day, he threw something in the, in the ocean and that was the end of it. But it's interesting. I want you to note that, th- that the system, Babylon, was not merely dropped into the sea. Look at verse 21. But it was violently thrown down into the sea. It's not like, oops, we dropped it. It's like, yeah, boom. You know, I mean, it's spiked into the sea. It's a deliberate and violent action. And once thrown into the sea, Babylon, quote, shall not be found anymore. What does that mean? Final, complete, absolute. That's eternal damnation. Verse 22, we see some nuances of Babylon's judgment and destruction. We see no more music. I don't know about you. I do know about you. If there's no more music, I'm pointing to the, the three guys from the worship team. There, No more music for me. That would be a sad day. That'd be a sad day. Uh, no more manufacturing. You see that in the you see that in the thing, the. Um, the craftsman, no more manufacturing, no more creative things, no more things being made. Uh, no more, and again, there's some difference in, in uh, some differences of opinion as to what kind of mill this is. But uh, I think the majority opinion that it's a mill that has to do with with food, and there's no more food. You know, that, that'd be a bad thing, especially for those of us who well like to eat, you know. Um, and then in verse 23, more nuances of Babylon's judgment and destruction. No more light. That's pretty serious. How about no more marriage? Listen, when marriage breaks down, that's the judgment of God. Oh, I hope God doesn't judge us for, for what's going on in our nation with the, with the, the shift in the, the love affair that our nation has with homosexuality. Uh, uh, I hope God doesn't judge us because of the breakdown of marriage. Listen, our love affair with homosexuality as a nation and the breakdown of marriage is God's judgment. It is God's judgment. Read Romans chapter 1. 
Um, no more romance, no more family, no more relationships. Wow. And, and no more of these things. Listen, anymore. I mean, you know, it doesn't mean like, oh, we're going to have to do without for a while. We're, you know, we're in tough times. You know, some of these things we have to throttle back. It's gone. For what cause? All these were exploited. All of these things that are listed here, the, 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 the music, the manufacturing, the food, the, the, uh, the light, the, the romance, all these things were exploited by the merchants and those in power to make merchandise of everything. Have you noticed that everything is merchandised? Have you noticed? I mean, I don't want you to start looking at your clothing right now, but I mean, it's just, it's just a small thing, but it's like, you know, all the tags are on the outside. We're walking advertisements for other people. You know, I mean, I get a car, you know, my brand new eight-year-old car. And, and the first thing I do is I take off that license plate frame that's advertising those people that sold me the car. Hey, hey if I'm going to advertise for you, I want to cut. You know, buy my gas or something. You know, I mean, do something for me. The whole world's advertised. You can't get anywhere without advertising. Uh, again, it's just nothing is sacred. Nothing is excluded from being advertised or from being, being tur- turned into a money-making scheme. And the world was deceived into believing that everything is about money, everything is about power, and the things that money and power can acquire. What did Jesus say on that? What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? That's what this chapter is about. It's about the world thinking we're, we've got it all and we don't need God. And go, oh, yes, you do. Because I'm coming. And then verse 24, the, the greatest, you know, this is like saved for the last. And I think it's just like the last little boom. It's not something that we want to discount because it's, it's small and it's at the end. And it might seem like it's just tacked onto the end. But you know what? Here's what really, really causes our Father in heaven to be furious even more furious than he is with the the money and power loving world systems verse 24 and in her was found the blood of the prophets and saints all of who were slain on the earth you know the worst of all and the ultimate reason for god's fury the world system has been responsible for the deaths of god's people who were slain for opposing the world's system god says hey it's coming well, the last two chapters have been pretty pretty heavy some really good news stick around for chapter 19 next week because we see the victory party of jesus let's pray shall we father we ask that as we read of all these judgments even though it seems it's just it's bitter it's dark it's it's horrible yet more than once in this chapter alone we are told that god's people should rejoice that we should rejoice in god's judgment on those who oppose him father of course our first desire is that people would not oppose him would repent and be saved but those who will not, it is, it is cause for rejoicing that God, that you will vindicate yourself and that you will show that you are right and that you are in control and all of the, the, the great things that puny people have sought to do to make a name for ourselves ever since the, the building of that tower in Babel or Babylon you will finally, once and for all, pull the plug so that opposition to you will never be heard anymore. And that's cause for rejoicing. And the reason we can know that it's going to happen, God, is you said so. And your Son is Lord. No one or nothing can alter your plans, God. So we rejoice that Jesus Christ is King. Amen.